This is an introduction to polynomial curve sketching done by hand. Okay, so analytically, some people may say, and this is a uh, this is fairly basic approach. There are things you can do beyond this, of course, but hey, we have to start somewhere, don't you think? So. Our learning goal is we're using a function stationary points, the intercepts, and the behavior, what we call the behavior of the curve, um, to an analytically sketch the function across a restricted domain. Okay, so that's, and that's what the example is going to show. So here's a bunch of steps that I would recommend if you're learning how to do this at a, at a reasonably basic level. There are things we can add to it. Now some of the things you may encounter in the future in future studies beyond this are these steps I haven't color coded and <clears throat> they're in a faint font. So for the purposes of this if you're taking notes don't take notes on those uh, unhighlighted ones but you will come across them uh, in the future I reckon. So when sketching the graph of some function whether we call it uh, y or f of x I would like you to consider these steps find and you don't have to do it in this order but you know this is a pretty good order determine or find the y-intercept okay the y-intercept happens when x equals zero you've done that before determine the x-intercept or intercepts it's variable how many there are by solving f of x equals zero and you should have done that if you're watching a video about this you must have done that in the past. Now uh, you could be unlucky and not get any intercepts if the um, if it's not possible to solve it. Okay uh, that happens sometimes and just makes it a little bit harder because there's some points you don't have. Step three determine the coordinates of the stationary points so it could be um, maxima or minima points of horizontal inflection that's P-O-H-I all right uh, determine the nature of the stationary points okay identifying what they are. So the first one, three, is the location and that's the nature of them. What are they? Because there's three main types of stationary points we look at. The, the next one there again is not highlighted so don't copy it down but be aware that you can, uh, there can be these things called oblique inflections which is when what's called the concavity changes. So it goes from being concave down to concave up without it actually becoming a horizontal inflection point. Okay, so um, that, that sort of thing there. Okay, so the concavity changed. Um, that's something that we'll do later on when we do the second derivative. Okay, and it can, it can be done in a variety of ways. Okay, and the, the, there is an inflection point, but it's not horizontal. Don't worry about that now. That's, that's later. Okay, laters. We got step five, um, consider the restrictions on the domain. Some, some tasks um, restrict the domain and some tasks don't restrict the domain, okay? Um, this one we're gonna do now is a restriction on the domain. Um, and from that, calculate the coordinates of the end points. They're important, don't forget to do them. Some people forget to do them and um, there's issues. Um, whether we're using this for curve sketching or graphing or what's called optimization, which we'll learn very soon. Okay, so we'll look at what's called the endpoints, and we get them from the, any restrictions on the domain, any restrictions for x. And from that, comparing them to steps 4 and 5 above, we can determine the global max or min, which we looked at in a previous video. Um, now, on some, some functions, uh, it's important to identify uh, vertical and horizontal asymptotes, all right? Asymptotic behavior is something I've covered in other videos. All right, if you want to look at how to do that, I've got some other videos that look at asymptotes. For example, rational functions or hyperbolas, okay? Um, they have discontinuities. Now, we're doing polynomials, so we said uh, this one is polynomial, right? So we don't have to worry about discontinuities because polynomials are continuous. And um, after the global max, global minimum, we look at, consider the direction of f of x or the behavior you could you could replace this word with behavior of the function as x approaches positive and then negative infinity so at each end what's it doing okay so when we're talking about infinity as uh, as we get to really big positive and really big negative numbers okay 
Um, this next bit is not highlighted, so don't copy it, but um, you can do the same with the d derivative that says f dash of x there, all right? And um, that tells you how the gradient's changing, okay? Um, you can add that if you want to, but I don't expect you to use that just yet. So it can tell you that uh, as you get to really big numbers, the curve is approaching, you know, um, positive infinity and it's getting steeper or it's getting less steep. So it can tell you some extra stuff to do a cooler drawing. But again, this is only a basic one. And I reckon if you're allowed to have a calculator there, after you've done all this by hand, evaluate your work, check it out, compare it with tech. Okay, it's a good way to check how good you are at this and give yourself some feedback and maybe a pat on the back. Let's do one now and you can see that we have to sketch by hand this cubic here, y equals x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x for this restricted domain, negative 2 up to 4 inclusive. Following our seven magic steps, I'll even number them for you if you like. All right, so the first one is the y-intercept, okay, so you've you know, if you're watching this video in developmental order, you'll know uh, how to find a y-intercept, okay? Y-intercept is when x equals 0. So we've got um, the function above there, all right? And so really, you can look at that. Um, it'll be y equals 0 cubed, which is 0, minus 6 times 0 squared, which is 0 plus 9 times 0, which is 0. How exciting. So y equals 0. So when x equals 0, y equals 0, and that means the y-intercept is the origin. Ooh, all right. So now, little note here, that means this will pop up when we do the x-intercepts as well, that same result. So the origin is both in this function, both the 1x intercept and it's also the y-intercept so it's, it does two things okay all right <clears throat> um, the next one was uh, the x-intercept or intercepts okay the zeros some people might say okay that correspond with the roots of the equation so that means y equals zero so while this one was a substitute this one is a solve okay so um, we've got to set it equal to 0, so 0 for y, 0 equals x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x. Okay, now, notice how there's no constant term here. That's actually good news. Don't overlook this method of factorizing. It's not a quadratic, it's a cubic. Don't fret, because there's no constant term on here. This one if you look at all those terms, each of them has a factor of x. So take x out as a start, and you'll get a nice quadratic inside. Aha! Uh -huh. And you'll see that that's actually, if you know your stuff, that's actually a perfect square expansion. So that will factorize to a minus b all squared. Okay, so we have x outside of um, a squared is 9, so a is 3, so it's x minus 3 all squared. All right, now um, it's true that uh, cubics will have one or three roots with real numbers, but this one's got what's called a repeated factor or a repeated root, so it'll actually provide the same answer twice, so we only need to take it once. So, you know, this is equal to zero, so we've got the null factor law, which you should know already typically in advanced year 10 courses. Null factor law means that if you've got a product of two things, all right, the x and the stuff in brackets, call that two things, okay? Um, yes, I know that would make x minus 3, x minus 3, but it's identical. So essentially we have two things, and um, to, to get 0, the first thing could be 0, and the second thing could be 0, or they could both be 0. They're cases, right? So that means... Um, x equals 0, all right, because that first factor there would be 0. And we've also got the case when x equals th 3, that will give us the, uh, the result inside this bracket equaling 0, which creates the null factor law there, okay? That it follows the null factor law. So there are two x-intercepts. So writing them down as proper coordinates, all right, that would be 0, 0, and I told you we'd see that again. There he is. All right, remember up there? 
and 3, 0. Okay, so that's the, that's the two places where it crosses the axis, x-axis in fact. Next we're trying to find the location of the stationary points, and how many too. Alright, this uh, step finds how many and where they are. Alright, we want to know where they are, we want to know where they live. Alright, and uh, how many we're dealing with. Okay, so we set, um, we've got to find dy dx and set it equal to zero because um, stationary points happen when we have a gradient of zero and that means the derivative is zero from all of our previous work. So if we've got um, y equals x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x, let's find dy dx. It's pretty easy. Alright, so we've got 3x squared minus 12x plus 9. We set it equal to zero, as we just said, and smart people will actually go, I can divide all the terms, including the zero, by three. They've all got a factor of three, so you get a nice, easy quadratic there. Okay, and then we can factorize that real easy. Um, we want x minus three, x minus one. Okay, and we can see that that equals zero. We've got the null factor law again, so we got x equals three um, and x equals one are our two solutions. Okay, and then we can find the location of those points. Now in the case of x equals three, we actually, if you look back at your work, you found that point already. If you look back here, uh, we already know what happens in the function if we sub in three. If we sub in th x equals three, we get y equals zero. So that um, that point, that x-intercept, is also a stationary point. It has two jobs, just like zero zero had two jobs. All right, very talented. So that stationary point occurs at three zero. This other one here, we have to sub one into the original equation not the derivative, the original equation, and you can do that by inspection. So um, we would have, uh, it was x cubed, so 1 cubed minus uh, 6 times 1 squared plus 9 by 1, pretty darn easy there. So we have 1 takes 6 is negative 5, um, negative 5 plus 9 is 4. All right, so we have um, at 4, the point 1, four we have our other stationary point okay next step we've got to find the nature okay the nature of the stationary point um, are they maxima minima is there one of each um, is it a point of inflection well this is what I would recommend nice little table makes good work now if you think about this as we scan across this dude here uh, one comes before three and we want to actually know um, like we saw in a previous video, is it like that, 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 or is it like that, 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 or is it like, eh, oops, sorry, eh, 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 or is it like, eh, 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 all right, if you understand that language I was just speaking, you'll understand what I'm doing now. So we've got nature of stationary points, well, we've got to look at, but each of these cases before, at, and after, before, at, and after, before, at, after, before, at, and after, so, See, if I repeat something enough, it'll sink in, maybe? Yeah. And we need something that's easy to substitute, right? And it's less than 1. Okay, not too far away from 1 is kind of nice, too. So we need some x values, and I'm going to choose uh, something that's less than 1 is 0. That's handy, it's easy to substitute. Then we want at, which is 1, at, at stationary point. Then we want, um, further down the track, we want 3 as well. But we need one that's after the first stationary point. So the first stationary point is at 0. So if we put in a nice easy number like 2, that also serves the before um, part for the next stationary point. And we need something after. That. So you might as well just put in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 there. And what we have to do on the next line... That's x, and we need to know about dy dx because that will tell us the gradient. This was all in a previous video. We know that, see, all we need to know is whether it's negative or zero or positive. 
Okay, that's all we need to know. So that's why easy to sub in numbers are the way to go. We already know two of these. We know the fact that at x equals 1 and at x equals 3, we have a stationary point. Therefore, the gradient is 0 there. So we have 0, 0. If we sub zero into the equation, original equation, you will actually get a positive value. All right. When I say original equation, I didn't mean that. I meant the um, derivative, because so, we're talking about the derivative there. Okay, sorry. Um, and then you can try this for yourself. S sub in two, and you'll get a negative quantity, and you sub in four, you get a positive, right? So we can see what's going on here. We've got uh, at we got before positive gradient at negative after so this one here is a max hi max so uh, max is at x equals 1 4 so there's a maximum there's the nature of that one the maximum at 1 4 all right and then we've got another one we have um, that's at that's the at so at, at 3 its derivative is zero. Beforehand, we can share that point for the both purposes. It's negative, so it's going down, and after it, it's going up. So that's a minimum. All right, minimum at that point three zero. So we know now the nature of those two stationary points, and they're they're turning points. They're not inflections. One max and one min. Now we need to check the endpoints to see if that gives a higher max or a lower min than these locals. All right, these are local, one local max and one local min. All right, and they're also stationary points. The endpoints can be lesser and greater in some cases, so we need to check it out. All right, so remember we had um, negative two through to four as our interval, it's a restricted domain, and we need to check the endpoints. So checking the bottom end first, the when x equals negative 2, that's the lower end for x, we can sub that in. So if you sub that into the function, um, you'll find that you get y equals this. And when I say function, the original function, y equals negative 50. Okay? Then at the top end, 4, we uh, if we sub x equals 4 in there, and you'll find that y, y equals 4. Okay? So that means that one endpoint exists at negative 2, negative 50. That's quite low down, isn't it? And the other one, other end, ends at 4, 4. Okay? Now we need to compare um, these, these two here with the two we just found. Okay? And so, um, let's see. Well, look, this, this minimum is way lower than that minimum. So that's that one there is your global minimum. All right. So um, we're going to put in global min. Okay. This one here is it higher than the pink one, which was a local max? Well, it's actually they're equal because the y values are the same. They're both four. So um, that's a global max and in fact I'm going to rename that one that's also a uh, global max it actually has two all right there, there's two global maxes two global maximums all right interesting function yeah interesting one so we need to do the behavior as x approaches uh, positive infinity and negative infinity so I'll do positive first Okay, and that means big numbers. All right, now when you've got a polynomial, hopefully you've learnt that uh, the leading term, which is a cubic, becomes the dominant term. If you think about putting big numbers in there, if you cube a really, really big number, it's going to have a much bigger effect than cubing a squared or a linear. Okay, so we really just look at the leading term in a polynomial. Okay, so the leading term. Okay, the leading term is what it's all about in a polynomial. Other functions we'll do later might have a slightly different approach. So as x approaches infinity, all right, y will y will approach infinity. Okay. So as x, I'll write it down again. As x approaches positive infinity, 
y will approach positive infinity. So that means as we go this way, we're also going that way, the curve will go to the right and rise. Okay, that'll help us sketch it in a minute. And then um, as the last little bit here, x approaches negative infinity, what have we got here? So we're looking at basically negative a negative x cubed. So x will be a negative value, okay? So uh, it won't be negative x cubed, but remember x will be negative because as we cube negative numbers, they stay negative, all right? Or they they are negative themselves. So as um, x approaches negative infinity, this will this will y will approach um, negative infinity as well. So it'll head downwards. So as it go, as we move to the left towards negative infinity on the curve, as we trace that down, it'll go down as well. Okay. Okay. When we do the sketch by hand, you don't have to have the same um, x and y scale. All right. And this one, you really don't want to. Okay. Because it covers a lot more ground in the y direction. So because you see, we've got if we go negative one, negative two here. Um, we need 50 expressed along here in the space we've got. So, um, you know, the, this might be um, 20, 40, 50 here, okay? So that's your end point. So let's put the end point in, negative 2, negative 50. All right, and then it, it goes through 0, 0, we saw. Okay, and we've got to go back and think about all those things we just worked out above and incorporate them into our curve. Okay, we also had one four. Now remember, I'm making these 20 each, all right? So that's that's 20, all right? Now one four was one of our points. So that, we've got a one there, two, three, and four. I could have made that a bit longer. All right, so we had... 1, 4, so it's not going to be much above the axis on this graph, so 1, 4, we might just put it there. It's a sketch, okay, it's not supposed to be a facsimile of a true graph. Um, then we had 3, 0, which was one of our places, our, our uh, x-intercepts, and then lastly we had the final part, which was the other end point, 4, 4, so I'm going to have to put that over there, it's a bit off scale. 4, 4. Now we put our sketch in, okay, and this one's, remember it's going to go up through here, peak there, okay, uh, and then cut back through there. Sorry, not cut there, but deflect there. So what I mean, okay, and we got the basic sketch there whoops uh, that shouldn't be pointy it should it's, my inflection is not so good there lastly checking with technology how did we do well I've already started and you can use um, geometry submenu and uh, put the points on there to represent the endpoints and it's important to remember how to do um, the Analyze graph if you're using a TI inspired to find the maxima and minima. So I'm going to find this maxima here, go either side, 1, 4, yay! All right, and you could find the this 3, 0 point two ways you could go minimum uh, or you could go zeros, it would give you the same point. Okay, so um, you know, it doesn't matter which one. All right, if I go zero, it'll say that one there, and if I try and do it again. It'll be interesting, won't it? Okay. Um, if I say minimum. Oh, look, it's identified the same point. I did all right.